Hello YouTubers, this is Cessna Ace back again with another 10 video ads video. This time concentrating on two formats, DVD and VHD. But before I get to them, I've been receiving quite a number of uh, CD imports, so I thought I would show some of them real quick. Yeah, real quick, right. Um, I have a cousin who has a grown daughter um, who has been suggesting K-pop groups to me. Okay, these are groups that she listens to. I've never really tried Korean pop before, so I thought I would give it a try. I saw this at Yes Asia. It was marked as a limited edition, and it's a CD maxi single, which is a format that really isn't that common here. It's much more common in Asia, apparently. The only time I've ever seen CD Maxi singles here in the United States was back when I worked for television and I was running audio and we'd get a band in and they would have a box of Maxi singles uh, for their latest uh, single that they were releasing. And uh, I got a couple of those. But other than that, I have never really run into CD Maxi singles here in the US. Now, I guess I could describe this as if you're old enough, if you remember, we are the world, we are the children. Well, this is a um, group that is comprised of 20 Korean pop stars, all singing the same song. Let's go. There are three different versions of Let's Go on this CD. Yes, that's right. There are only three tracks. The Korean version, which runs 3.30. Let's Go in English, which runs 3.30. And, well, it says Let's Go, and then in parentheses, MR, 3.28. I don't know what the MR is supposed to stand for. All I know is it's an instrumental version. I've listened to I've listened to all of these CDs, and I've ripped them into my computer. Now, after I received this, I wanted to double check to make sure that this was a limited edition. So I went back to Yes Asia's site, and they still had it listed as a limited edition. The only thing I can think of that might make it element edition is that it's autographed. Let's go Korean. Let's go English. Credits. Next up, we have Yunha. Now, you probably can't make out where it says just before Yunha, first album. But on the CD itself, you might be able to make it out. Now, when I first opened it, I thought that was a scratch, but it's a tether tied to what is supposed to be a balloon. There are 13 songs on here. Uh, one, two, three have uh, English titles, the rest don't. And um, one has, um, there is an instrumental version of one of the English language titled songs, which is I Cry. Okay, these next two I bought used, and I could swear that when I ordered them at Yes Asia, that um, they were in Japanese. And in fact, when I started listening to it, it sounded like it was Japanese. 
But then, a couple songs in, it's, oh, wait a minute, that sounds like it might be Cantonese. Well, I have a daughter who has been learning Chinese, and I have another daughter who's been teaching herself Japanese. And I asked them both and what they thought it sounded like. And one said, oh, that's definitely Japanese. And the other one, I was a couple songs in by then, said, that's definitely um, Cantonese. So, anyway, this has songs in Japanese, Cantonese, and Mandarin, I know, because in addition to uh, getting the feedback from my daughters, I went to Yes Asia site again and double checked, and sure enough, from languages it says Japanese, Cantonese, Mandarin. I think this might be a greatest hits compilation. Part one. After I listened to them and uh, ripped the songs into my computer, I put them back in their uh, protective outer sleeves so that it would keep the Hobby strips in place. The record label that put these out, by the way, is in Hong Kong. This is part two. I think that's a much better cover. That's my own personal opinion. Okay. I've mentioned several times that I like Falco, um, who sadly is no longer with us. He was an Austrian um, performer. And uh, his big hit in the United States was Rock Me Amadeus. But with each subsequent album that was released on CD here, it seemed to me that he was moving from uh, one label to a smaller label, then to another label that was even smaller than that one. And eventually I quit seeing his uh, CDs altogether. I have seen the title track to this CD on a 12-inch vinyl maxi single, but that might have been an import, or it might have been the only way um, that song was imported into the U.S. or released in the U.S. At any rate, it does have a crack in the cover, but that's easy to repair because I keep a lot of spare jewel cases on hand. He co-wrote every song on here, at least according to the credits. Made in the EU. Okay, now moving on to Sweden. I've mentioned in the past that prior to Sweden, each of the four members of uh, ABBA had their own successful careers going. Benny Anderson was in a popular rock group in Sweden called Hepstars. Most of what they did were covers of songs from outside of Sweden, from American and British bands usually. The few original songs that they released were written by Benny Anderson. Well, over at uh, Bjorn Novais' group, he was part of a uh, popular folk group, which even he admits has a goofy name, or had a goofy name, Hootenanny Singers. They mostly did covers, but the few that they did that were original were written by Bjorn Novais. That's him right there. Now, every song on here 
has a Swedish title except for two, Marianne and Gabrielle. And I'm going to try and stick a link to it down there. I've already put a link to it on my Facebook page. But uh, Gabrielle, they released that in seven different languages, which is something that I don't know what it is about Sweden, but ABBA did the same thing. They released some songs, uh, well, they released everything in English, but they released some songs in Swedish, some in German, some in French, a whole album's worth in Spanish. I'm thinking this must mean 16 hits or 16 songs or something because there are 16 songs on this CD. I had always thought that Polar was the um, recording studio that was started by ABBA, which they eventually sold. But the Hootenanny Singers predated ABBA, unless Polar uh, re released it. I don't know. I think that is uh, Bjorn there. Yeah. Okay. Post ABBA. Each of the four members had their own successful careers after ABBA. Anna Frid, Frida. She had a number of uh, successful solo albums, most of which were in English. Agneta uh, Falskog, she had a number of uh, successful solo albums, most of which were in English, but there was at least one that I have that is in Swedish. And, um, of course, she had had uh, four or five popular Swedish language solo albums prior to ABBA. But in any event, uh, Benny Anderson went on to form not only his own group after ABBA, but his own record label. The group is Benny Anderson's Orchestra, which is how it's known inside Sweden. Outside of Sweden, it's known as BAO. Now, the name of his record label is um, Mono Music AB. I still don't know what that means, AB, but I see it at the end of every record label I've ever seen in Sweden. It always ends with AB. I don't know what it means, but I've just made that observation. This is release uh, number 17, and uh, I think he has released 27 CDs on his own label and that there have been six or seven uh, of those were BAO. And of the ones that were BAO, most of them went gold and many uh, went on to uh, go platinum. This is a very interesting CD, BAO 3. I was surprised to learn, by the way, that um, BAO has uh, toured other countries and has, in fact, performed in the U.S. Something I forgot to show with this. Is that... All of the music is written by Benny Anderson. All of the lyrics are by Bjorn Novellius, produced by Benny Anderson. So they obviously have continued on with their songwriting partnership. But as I started to say, this is a really interesting album. 
One of the reasons is that it contains a song that Benny and Bjorn had started to write for ABBA back when ABBA was still together. But they hit a uh, brick wall, so to speak, on it and gave up on it and shelved it and went on to something else. But they have since finished it. And it is released on this CD. Now some of the songs that BAO perform are in English and some are in Swedish, but this one is sung in English. And it is called Crush on You. Now one of the problems ABBA had in the U.S., well, for one thing, you had to, to, to make it in the U.S. back then, you had to tour a lot. And they didn't want to tour a lot. Another thing was that uh, music critics and music buyers, for that matter, tended to pigeonhole groups. Now, you're a rock group. Now, you're a pop group. You're a jazz group. You're a folk group. You're a disco. Whatever. But ABBA did ballads. They did uh, pop. They did pop that was very close to uh, rock. Um, for example, if you're familiar with the song King Kong Song, that has a, a real hard rock sound to it. But they also did disco and they did uh, uh, Spanish ballads and um, tradition carried on by BAO. They do um, Swedish folk songs, they do um, big band music, they do pop, they do real close, they skate real close a couple times with rock. But anyway, very interesting group, BAO. Can't remember if I showed the inside of it or not. This is, uh, it was released by Mono Music. Oh, release 23. Okay. I really don't want to touch this as, as, um, I'll touch it as little as possible because it's printed on glossy black paper. And you know how that tends to pick up the oils from your skin and wind up with fingerprints. Music by Benny Anderson. Text, or that would be lyrics, by Bjorn Hovellius. Now, from what I understand, Bjorn doesn't perform much anymore, but he still writes songs. Okay, DVDs. I would only recommend this for purists or completists, um, and even then it's questionable. ABBA Dancing Queen Interviews. Contains no music or performances by the artist. And some of the clips that they use are in horrible condition. For example, on some of them they tend to look green. I don't think that Agneta ever dyed her hair green for any of their TV appearances. Uh, but I only paid about a dollar ninety eight for that, which is about what I paid for this. Bear exposure. Okay, I paid three or four dollars for this one, but I have watched it a number of times.
Brian Epstein, Inside the Fifth Beetle. Now, one of the guys um, that they interview, he talks about a conversation he had over the phone with Brian Epstein. Where does that sting? Because one pronounced, they both had last names that ended the same way. Stein or Steen. One pronounced it Stein, the other pronounced it Steen, and, and I gather that it's um, all of matter of what part of Europe you came from. But they do go into detail about the fact that Brian was a homosexual and that at the time it was illegal in England and if it had been widely known that he was a homosexual, he could have wound up dead. My how times change because by the 70s, uh, you were getting a lot of shows on British television that were in your face as far as that is concerned. For example, um, are you being served? Okay, this is a film that was originally released by MGM. It's uh, released now by Warner Archive. They remastered it. Not all Ar Warner Archive releases have been remastered, but this one has been. It's an extremely violent film, and it has a lot of action in it. Dark of the Sun. Now, if you remember, Rod Taylor and Yvette Bemieux co-starred together in the 1960 version of The Time Machine. Also features in the cast Jim Brown. and Kenneth Moore. I like how Warner Archive comes out with new titles every week. The well, thing is it makes it impossible to keep up. Okay, I only paid it about a dollar 98 or so for this one. This is part of a series of uh, Fanex Files. This is Fanex Files Samuel Z. Arkoff. The incredible story of the founder of American International Pictures. Arkoff, with his unerring eye for talent, helped launch the careers of Roger Corman, Martin Scorsese, Woody Allen, Francis Ford Coppola, Jack Nicholson, Robert De Niro, Michael Landon, and Dennis Hopper. This is on the Alpha Video label, but you don't have to guess too hard where I got it from. Anyway, I've watched this one a couple of times because I grew up in the 60s and in the 60s and throughout the 70s for that matter, uh, films from AIP were all over television. Vincent Price film. Dr. Fibes Rises Again. This is part of MGM's Midnight Movies series, and it was only two or three dollars. But the first time I ordered it, um, I didn't get it because they said it was out of print, it had been discontinued, and they weren't expecting to find any more. 
Well, the very next issue I got of oldies.com's um, catalog had it in there. So I went to their website and sure enough they had it. It was still ridiculously low in price, but it was listed as being discontinued. Their website indicated they only had like two copies left. So I picked it up. I have this on Laserdisc, but the Laserdisc that I have is a full screen pan and scan cropped affair. This one is um, letterboxed 1.85 to 1, enhanced for 16 by 9. Quite a few of these um, Midnight Movies releases. Okay, now on to the VHD. This is a cool, cool movie. It has some amazing car stunts in it. And in fact, you don't get 10 minutes into the film before you get your first major car chase. The Driver. Now, Steve McQueen did his own stunt driving in Bullet. Well, Ryan O'Neill did all of his stunt driving for this film. So they saved all the uh, car stunts for the end of the shoot so that they would at least have something they could release if, God forbid, something should happen. This is in English with Japanese subtitles. has Isabel Ajani in it. She was great in uh, the horror film Possession. If you've ever seen that, it was one of the films that was banned in England in, around 84 or 85. And the only versions of that that we got here in the U.S. were highly edited. So I went and bought Possession on Japanese Laserdisc because it was still in English just had Japanese subtitles and it was the complete unedited version. The edited version doesn't make any sense. This is a bit unusual, that the other side would be blank. Usually, they printed something there, or else they would have uh, used a double-sided single sheet. Okay. I was surprised to learn that this series has been around as long as, it, as long as it has been. Apparently it's very popular in France, where it was filmed, but also it's very popular in Russia and in Japan, hence they were released on VHD. But the more research I did, I found that this series actually dates back to the silent era. We're talking about Fantomas. Now, the one that I had already was, um, well, the, it translated into English, I think, as um, Fantomas is Unleashed. This, I believe, is the first film in the 1960s trilogy. As they did with the previous release that I have, it's letterboxed and they raised the letterboxed image up so that all the Japanese subtitles are in the bottom. 
over black. So real easy to see if you understand Japanese. No English language equivalent. Um, the best way I could describe this trilogy is James Bond meets Inspector Clouseau. Because the police chief that is uh, always after Fatimas is very much like uh, Inspector Clouseau. In other words, he's pretty much a bumbling idiot. The thing about these is they're so tightly in there, they're hard to get out. All the text on the back is in Japanese. Okay, I will put that back together when I'm done. Okay. I believe the title translates to Fontanus uh, versus Scotland Yard. Again, the image is in widescreen, which has been moved up higher so that they could put the Japanese subtitles over black. It retains their original French soundtracks. this one was used when I bought it and it doesn't have an insert. Steven Spielberg's Duel. Really cool movie. I already have it on VHS and I have it on Laserdisc also. This was made for television and it so impressed Universal that they gave him additional money to go out and shoot additional scenes so that they could release it theatrically overseas, which they did. But then they went and released it theatrically in the U.S. after it had already been shown on American television. And it was this film that um, Impressed Universal to the point where they gave him the film, the Sugarland Express, to film. And that impressed them enough that they gave him Jaws to direct and the rest is history. That's pronounced Kick Video. Kick Video was the official distributor for. Universal and Paramount Pictures in Japan. Cool, cool movie. By the way, piece of trivia, on the front grill of that truck is a piece of railroad track. Spielberg thought that that would um, make it look more menacing. Okay. Until next time, stay awesome.